the idea that Abraham, Abraham could argue with God about the destruction of the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities of the plains is outstanding. It's something out of your mind. We will not conceive that as a normal dialogue between humans and God. This is about God's judgment and God s comes down from heaven and has a meal with Abraham and then consoles Abraham and accepts his arguments. In the end, it saved the life of Lot and his family, though we know what happened with his wife, with Lot's wife. But this love that Abraham had for his nephew, it's revealing in this whole scheme of how God is to be understood. This is a blood issue. Abraham intercedes in the back of his mind. He's thinking of his nephew that he wants to save, but he's also thinking of more people that can be saved from the city if they are righteous and fights and argues with God. And in the end, the life of Lord is saved. This is fantastic. And this definitely points to a vision of God that is a slightly different to the one that those that believe in Calvinism have. He goes on to say in verse 32, And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. Per adventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. Amazing. Love is the binding rule of judgment. God is interested in dialogue with humans. God accepts humans' input in the dialogue. God does not simply know the future or an act. Instead, God seeks advice. Now, there are those that will say, this is pretend, pretend advice. This is not real. This is a pantomima in Latin. Something of the appearance, only a facade in French. <laughs> I take the Bible more seriously than that. I take the Bible as giving me the account of the view of God, particularly when God is involved. So I take the Bible as it says, and I avoid the terms literally or symbolically because those are not good terms to define how the Bible is to be taken. The Bible should be taken as it comes, in its context, with its truth. Is the truth of God revealed in a particular context and a particular culture, and it comes to me still as the Word of God, to be applicable in my context and in my culture. The Bible is a very serious document. It involves the Godhead. So God does not simply know the future. That's not the view of the Bible. God is seeking advice. God consults with his people and accepts their advice. God knows all and does not have to think about it. Versus God thinks, consults, decides, repents, and tries again. Why? All to respect human free will, human autonomy. This is a fantastic idea. This is an outstanding idea that God will be interested in taking us so seriously and loving us so passionately that God will sit down and talk with us. And you saw several examples. Review it again in the PowerPoint and read them. Think it through. If we do not like it, we have a chance to argue with God. Do it! Isaiah 1.18 Come now, let us reason together. God invites us to argue. In a Jewish culture, very similar to my Puerto Rican culture, I grew up with the thinking process happening, not in my brain, but in my tongue. This was the thinking instrument. And whatever I processed, it came out. Freedom. 
total autonomy to say what you have in mind. I know, I know, I have three sons and I have a wife and they have me and they have been teaching me and pounding me to think differently. And I have, believe it or not, changed a lot. The point I'm making is arguing was part of my cultural upbringing. I grew up in an environment where my father and my grandfather would argue. And then they would kiss each other and love each other and continue walking. Sometimes the argument was intense and they would not talk to each other for a week, perhaps three weeks, but they would kiss and move on. And there was a lot of kissing in my growing up. Isaiah 118, come now let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Praise to the heavens. Thank you, God. We can ask wisdom and God will answer. James 1.5, my favorite verse in regards to wisdom. If any of you lacks wisdom, where's the line? I am there. I lack wisdom. I want to make the line. I want to be there. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. That's me, Johnny, asking God. Who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. Does it get sweeter than that? Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. James wrote, it will be given to him. God shows no favoritism with anyone. Romans 2, 11 to 16 are key. We have to step back and think this through. I will read only the highlighted verse, but you should read the whole. Which show the work of the law, written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the mean while accusing or else excusing one another. So how will the judgment take place? The scriptures tells us, Paul wrote, the Bible says that there are two standards for judgment. Ultimately, it's saying that really there's one standard. The one standard is what is in your side, your brain, your consciousness, your relationship with God, a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. Now, the consciousness may be fed by the word of God, which is the advantageous point to be, I prefer that. I want to know. I am one that wants to know. I want to research it. I want to read it. I want to know what the text says. But it's about what's in my brain. I want to feed my brain with the word so I will be judged accordingly. And those that have not been fed by the word, they will still be judged by their brains, by their minds, by their spirit in the day of judgment. Are we together here? Read it again if you don't see it. God will use humans to help in the final judgment. 1 Corinthians 6, 3. Do, not, do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Revelation 24. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on his, their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Are you seeing the picture? God invites humans to partake of the judgment in the final day and the final events. Outstanding. 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 If anything is better to suffer, it's better to suffer doing good. If anything, it is better to suffer doing good. 1 Peter 3, 16 to 18. Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against you, 
against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. In the events of the second coming, in preparation and in association with this holy sanctuary in heaven, we humans are partakers of the ministry of judgment. We, frail humans, we, sinful humans, imperfect, God wants our opinions. God wants our judgment. No, no, this is not pretend. This is for real. I take the Bible as it comes, the message of God. God is waiting to save you and me. Let's read the highlighted, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us ward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Do you like the King James flavor? <laughs> For those who enjoy it, I'm using it. <laughs> the Word of God says that the reason why Jesus has not returned already, and the reason why we are not in heaven already, is because of love of us. God has a passion to include us, and he wants to be sure to include as many as he can. He's looking for reasons to include, not for reasons to exclude. But ultimately, it is a mystery why Jesus has not returned and why we're not in heaven today. 2 Thessalonians 2. For the mystery of iniquity. Yes, it's a mystery. The Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. Satan will be destroyed. But right now for us, the here and now, the bedside, when you're dealing with life and death issues, it is a mystery. And we do well in keeping silent. Most of the time, when people say, why did I have to suffer this disease? Why did my child die and not the child of the neighbor? And I tell you a story. It happened at Montemorelos University. Two very dear friends. One had a child who was diagnosed with cancer. Another had a child who was diagnosed with cancer at the same time. Members of the same community, members of the same prayer group. One child, after a year and a half of chemotherapy, is safe, is declared clean of cancer. The other child dies. One mother gives the testimony, I have heard it with my own ears, her sermon, giving the testimony of salvation for her son and answer to prayer. The other mother, my wife heard her, and I heard my wife's testimony, how her child died and she asked why did her child her son survive and mine had to die my wife was telling me he did not know what to say he changed she changed the subject don't have to say anything it's a mystery it is satanic causes god is suffering along with us Jesus is as anxious to return as we are because the one who suffers the most is God. Conclusion. What is no mystery is the final solution, the second coming of Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me, said Jesus. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? Would I be a liar, in other words? And if I go and prepare a place for you, 
I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. This is the way it is. We are here waiting for the solution. This time I used the NIV. I could not resist. Excuse me, those King James lovers. Amado Nervo wrote a poem that I love, translated into English. Very close to my sunset, I bless you, life, because you never gave me a hope that failed, neither an unjust job nor an undeserved pain. And I see at the end of my tough road that I was the architect of my own destiny. It's because I put on them vile or tasty honey. When I planted roses, I grew always roses. True, to my youth will follow the winter. But you never said May would last forever. May meaning the spring. I found very long the nights of my sorrows. But you never promised me only good nights. On the other hand, I also had some sacred serene nights. I love, I was love, the sun caressed my face. Life, you owe me nothing. Life, we are at peace. This message from Amado Nervo is a humanistic message. It's a message without God. God is not in the picture of this beautiful poem. I love the poem, but my precious God, my precious Jesus is not part of the ideas of the thinker as expressed in this poem. So I take this and I add the second coming. What do I mean by that? Be at peace with yourself. The second coming of Christ is not about fear. The millennium and the judgment are not about death and fear. It is about being at peace. Being at peace because the question you have to answer is, am I being true to my conscience? Am I following what Romans 2 says is the judgment standard for the final day? My conscience. Am I following what I have learned? Am I living up to the scriptures that I love? If I am, if I am trying, if I am in the fight, in the struggle, I know that not everything will turn out right. There are struggles in life. But I also know that God is in control. Revelation 19, 6 through 9, we end with the Bible. We cannot end with a poem from Amado Nervo, as good as it is. <laughs> we have to end with the poetic words of a truthful word of God. And it says, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, Write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. Have you gotten the invitation to the wedding of the Lamb? This is the save the date reminder. The invitation is found in the Gospels. When you think of the second coming of Christ, when you think of the millennium, when you think of the judgment, when you think of the holy sanctuary in heaven, it's about a family reunion, about a wedding party, and you and I are the wedded bride, partakers of the wedding, the guest and also the bride. And Jesus is the bridegroom and the judge and the savior. 
And God is thinking of you as God invites you to this party. Are you listening?